So how does the cell take an electrical signal, the action potential, and translate it into a chemical signal? There's quite a bit of molecular complexity required to enable the speed and precision of vesicle release of neurotransmitters into the synapse. Over the next few segments, we'll go through the presynaptic machinery of chemical release. Let's first take a walk in the shoes of Bernard Katz, the same Katz from the Goldman-Hodgkin CAX equation, or GHK equation, that we learned about in the first module of MCB-ADX. Katz's story is a particularly beautiful example of how scientific inquiry can unfold over the course of multiple generations. Katz was an electrophysiologist and biochemist who conducted some of the deceptively simple experiments in the 1950s that were fundamental to our understanding of signal transduction. It starts with an observation. Back in the 1920s, a physiologist named Otto Loewy noticed that he could extract a substance from the nerve near the heart of a frog and squirt that substance on a different beating heart and cause the heart to slow down. This was a landmark discovery proving the existence of neurotransmitters. That is, this change was induced by some molecule or chemical inside the fluid he squirted onto the different heart, rather than some intrinsic electrical property. Lovie's discovery of the substance, many years later identified as acetylcholine, set the stage for Bernard Katz to investigate the mechanism of the release of neurotransmitters from tiny structures, microns across, called vesicles. The invention of the electron microscope would eventually reveal these minuscule vesicles. But Katz worked before electron microscopes and advanced molecular biology, before personal computers, and before sophisticated electronics. Rather than studying the synapse between two neurons, Katz chose to study the neuromuscular junction, or NMJ, the place where a nerve attaches to a muscle. The NMJ has many features that are similar to the synapse in the central nervous system, with the added benefit that a muscle fiber is a lot easier to record from using simple electrodes. But the principles we discuss here can be applied to both neuron-to-neuron -neuron synapses and NMJs. The primary neurotransmitter at the NMJ is acetylcholine, which as you might recall is the neurotransmitter used for voluntary motor control. As an aside, understanding the ins and outs of acetylcholine and how it's processed plays an important role in modern anesthesia, where muscle relaxants like succinylcholine and its derivatives are routinely used when intubating patients. Let's walk through some of Katz's experiments and see what scientists have learned from them. The earliest experiments simply attempted to measure the timing of the signals in the presynaptic and postsynaptic terminals using electrodes and amplifiers. Here we have a synapse with a presynaptic terminal, synaptic cleft, and postsynaptic terminal. Remember, the action potential will come in from the presynaptic neuron into the presynaptic terminal to be transformed into a chemical signal, which will then excite the postsynaptic terminal. The tools that CATS had available were basically limited to tungsten recording electrodes, much like the ones we saw used by Hodgkin and Huxley to study the action potential. We'll have a stimulation electrode placed at the presynaptic side to replicate the incoming action potential, and we'll put a recording electrode on the postsynaptic side. In this case, since we're measuring a neuromuscular junction, that'll be in the muscle. What you're seeing in the trace is the depolarization induced in the downstream cell, which in this case is a muscle fiber. Let's stop and talk a bit about terminology first, before we go too much farther, since you'll probably see these terms in a lot of neuroscience textbooks, as well as in the rest of the lessons here. In general, the response of the postsynaptic neuron is termed a postsynaptic potential. We can classify different postsynaptic potentials into several categories. Either excitatory, meaning that the neuron is more likely to fire because it's closer to threshold, or inhibitory, where the received signal makes the neuron less likely to fire. Thus, we have either excitatory postsynaptic potentials, which are commonly called EPSPs, and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, or IPSPs. At the neuromuscular junction, like CATS originally used, things are a little bit different, so we'll see some slightly different terminology used. The nerves touching the muscle fibers form flat structures called end plates, and the potentials recorded here are called end plate potentials, or EPPs. 
To help understand the inner workings of synapses, scientists like Bernard Katz would stimulate the presynaptic neuron and measure the EPSPs, IPSPs, or EPPs. While varying properties of the local environment around the synapse, such as the concentration of various ions in the surrounding bath. However, interestingly, it was what happened in between periods of actively stimulating the presynaptic neuron that gave Katz one of his most important clues to the nature of synaptic transmission. Using highly sensitive amplifiers to magnify the tiny signals from the neurons, Katz noticed small spontaneous blips in the voltage recorded in the absence of any stimulus. While many might have dismissed these blips as simply being noise from the experimental setup, Katz's careful observation convinced him otherwise. Thank you.